I don't know how bad of a year 2017 is gonna be, but at least it started off pretty good for me during the first week, which played host to MAGFest. MAGFest is where they take a fancy hotel and convert it into a giant arcade showroom. In 2015, I saw some guys really going ham over intense competitive head-to-head -head Burger King Big Bumpin'. And this year, I got engaged to my beautiful fiance, Rin Ishikawa. I'm waiting for the aliens to come. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, she oh, took you... my stick. She grabbed my stick. I also got to play with an incredibly rare, one-of-a-kind prototype, something that represents a pivotal moment in gaming history, something that's become kind of an urban legend in the gaming community, and that is the Nintendo PlayStation. Like the Atari ET landfill or the Polybius arcade cabinets, the Nintendo PlayStation is an innocuous piece of discarded plastic that a cult following has turned into a pearl of an artifact. The story begins around 1987. Collaborations between Sony and Nintendo began with Ken Kutaragi developing the Super Famicom sound chip for Nintendo without the approval of his senior bosses at Sony. When they found out, they were understandably furious, but one executive let it slide and gave their approval, since the partnership deal was poised to give Sony a lot of leverage into gaming, which was one of their stops on the corporate agenda for the next few years. So when it came time for Nintendo to build a next-gen game console after the original NES, Ken Kutaragi and Sony were their cutting-edge partners for pushing new mediums for interactive media for games. Specifically, Sony's CD-ROM, which was originally planned to be integrated into the SNES early in its life cycle, with a separate add-on called the Super CD snapping onto the top and bottom of the console, while a separate version of the console being sold as an all-in-one piece would combine both. This is what the brand PlayStation, which was two words back then, originally referred to, an alternate and more expensive version of the Super Nintendo that had a CD drive as well as the cartridge slot. And combining CD media with Sony's holdings in media for music and movies was their big vision for the future. The president of Sony Electric Publishing at the time, Olaf Olafsson, was interviewed on the set of Hook saying, quote, The video game business will be much more interesting than when it was cartridge-based. By owning a studio, we can get involved right from the beginning, during the writing of a movie. But Sony's contract with Nintendo to make CD-based software was cleverly worded to give Sony absolute control over the license and manufacturing of CD games, which at the time were, arguably correctly, speculated to become the next generation medium for games. But evidently Nintendo didn't understand those terms nor attempt to contest them, because a day after the PlayStation's announcement at the Chicago Consumer Electronics Show in June of 1991, they chose instead to announce a partnership to make CD-based games with Philips, Sony's classic foreign rival. And this is a damning move that may have been a profound turning point in Nintendo's history. Consider how reluctant Nintendo was to adopt disc-based games for the rest of the 90s, and then consider that their original contract with Sony would have had them forfeiting profits for games made on non-proprietary formats. Also consider third-party support, which has kind of become Nintendo's Achilles heel. Back then, they didn't just violate their contract with Sony by going with Philips, but they also violated their reputation. It was a big faux pas in the Japanese business community to be turning against a Japanese competitor in favor of a foreign one. Also consider how little resources and supervision were actually put into those crappy CDI games. Then consider the possibility that Nintendo's partnership with Philips was a throwaway one used instead to gain leverage over Sony into scaring them in better terms, rather than actually making good Nintendo games for the CDI. The long-term effects of this decision may have cost Nintendo an easy victory over the fifth generation of consoles, if not every single one thereafter, because now they had to compete with the Sony PlayStation, which gave Microsoft the courage to make the Microsoft Xbox. But for the short term, back in 91 and 92, their move was a fleeting victory. After leaving to work with Sega on games for the Sega CD for a few months, Sony did eventually come back to Nintendo. In October of 92, Nintendo, Philips, and Sony all agreed to use the same format of CD standards worldwide, with Nintendo being given control and licenses over gaming software for Sony's upcoming 32-bit PlayStation, in addition to Philips' Super CD add-on, which they had now been rewarded, and Sony was instead given control of non-gaming CD software. All of that, which sounds really confusing. Because that was all just planning that didn't pan out. At this point, it was evident that the Sega CD and NEC's TurboGrafx-16 were failing, as was Sega's strategy of developing console add-ons. While Nintendo's development on the Super FX chip was progressing, they were evidently spooked away from CD-ROMs, console add-ons, and a new 32-bit generation of consoles entirely. And all those plans to collaborate with Sony and Philips were canned. 
But it was during the years before when a number of PlayStation prototypes, reportedly 200 of them, were made. And according to this forum post from a supposed former Sony employee, a game based on Hook was in development for the Super CD, alongside other Sony digital picture titles as well as an FMV scrolling space shooter called Forteza that looks similar to Silphied. Keep in mind that this post would be nothing more than anonymous internet speculation if it didn't mention that way back in 2007 one of the completed PlayStation prototypes was sitting on the desk of Olaf Olafsson. Fast forward to 2009 and that same prototype ends up in the hands of a man named Terry Diebold who didn't know what it was until 2015 when it blew up into this huge story that has him touring around the world. So in 2017, I got a chance to talk with Terry and his son Dan about their discovery. Prior to um, me getting it, uh, Olaf Olison, he was the uh, CEO of Sony back in the day. And when he left, um, I guess, Sony throughout the years, he ended up becoming a board member at Advanta Corporation. Um, when he had an office up in New York and it closed down, they packed up all his personal stuff and they shipped it to our warehouse in Horsham, PA. And uh, when the Advanta went bankrupt in 2009, I was uh, responsible. Um, my VP sent me to um, the two boardrooms. We had one in Delaware and one in Springhouse. And she wanted me to pack up all the plates, cups, dishes, saucers, everything. They were silver lined. You had eight board members. Uh, she told me to save a certain money because we still weren't closed yet. Uh, so when I got the stuff and I saw it, I was like, wow, this stuff's pretty nice. I mean, you just don't buy one cup of saucer, you buy two or three of each. That way, if one breaks, you got to put the exact same color down next to the guy sitting next to you because that's just the way they are, you know what I mean? So a lot of it was still brand new. So I was packing it up and I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to bid on this. <laughs> so that's uh, what you were hoping to end up with at the auction? Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know. Well, what had happened was I was out sick uh, for a couple weeks. And when I got back, to get in on the online auction, if you wanted to get in on it, you had to sit in the auditorium with a paddle in Springhouse. So I got in on it. And there was a few um, auction numbers I wanted to bid on. This was one of them. So when I won the bid, I went and saw the auctioneer to pay him. And they took me over my lot number. And it was a lot bigger than, because I packed the boxes. And I signed, uh, you know, what was in the boxes. There was a lot of boxes there that I didn't know about. There's nothing written on it or anything. It took me two car loads to get the stuff home. Uh, one of them had shoes and ties in them, which belonged to Olaf Olson. Another one had some plaques in there, and I actually got a plaque with his name on it, says Olaf Olson. And then uh, another one had like 250, 300 music CDs. Uh, so a lot of them were still wrapped in cellophane. And then the other one had the uh, Nintendo PlayStation in it, along with the controller and the BIOS um, cart, and then um, probably about 30 some games. For the sake of context, Advanta was an American banking company specializing in investments for small businesses, but like many banks in the late 2000s, they found themselves spiraling into bankruptcy as their interest rates soared alongside their credit losses. Being the president of Advanta was Olafson's job between Sony and Time Warner, which is a bit uncharacteristic for him. Though he hasn't opened up for interviews about the Nintendo PlayStation, Olafson isn't known for having a dry personality as far as financial executives go anyway. His career has focused an awful lot on entertainment. After helping usher in the PlayStation brand in the 90s, he's been writing historical fiction novels and striking international media deals as the executive vice president of Time Warner. But his time as president of Advanta lasted only two years, ending in 1999. But somehow an old forgotten box of his personal belongings stayed in the company warehouse 10 years after his resignation. When Terry bid on those boxes during the company's closeout auction, he was expecting to score an expensive load of silverware. Uh, he's in Time, Time Warner right now. He might be uh, president of Time Warner right now. I'm not even sure, to tell you the truth. Yeah, he's at Time Warner. He's yeah. like somewhere high up, and he writes books now. Yeah, he's a pretty smart guy. If you ever read the bio on him, you find out he's, he's got a lot going on upstairs, but it was I bet that's smart to uh, you know give us the PlayStation prototype by accident. They ended up with the console, but it was his son Dan who actually knew what it was. Eventually. It sat in the attic for six years before we finally learned about what exactly it was on the internet. I knew what we had, I just didn't know how rare it was. Like when he brought it home, uh, I was like, oh, whoa, this, ain't, this doesn't look like any uh, PlayStation I've ever <laughs> seen before. Yeah. And then uh, I did a little bit of research online, couldn't find too much information, and then uh, yeah. I just got stored in the attic for a bit. Uh, yeah, that day I posted the YouTube video because originally I had um, commented on a post on Reddit that was talking about like how Sony and Nintendo once were collaborating, and I just 
was reading it a little bit and I was like, oh, hey, I think I have one of these like at my dad's house. And <laughs> nobody believed me. Yeah, he got beat up bad. So I called him <laughs> from Denver where I live and I was like, hey, I need you to go up to the attic and take that thing out and send me some pictures. He was like, what for? You know, like, what do you need those for? And I was like, <laughs> just do it. So he went up there, he brought it down and he had this like awful cell Flip phone on. at the time. Yeah. He sent me some pictures and I was like, there's no way I can post these online. Like, it's like those pictures, you know, of like the Yeti, they're like blurry, and like kind of, so not really. Could have been anything behind the yeah. yeah. And I was like, I can't post these online. This is not good proof. People are going to still call me a liar. So. That would be the plain thing. <laughs> So what they're doing right now is basically touring the world showing it off because all these gaming conventions are paying for their travel, food, and lodging to uh, just kind of put it in a display case and answer people's questions. In Hong Kong, they started hooking up with people who were attempting to repair it, and that was an effort that didn't really bear fruit until they sent it off to Ben Heck, who took it apart and got it playing Super NES carts again because when they originally found it, it wasn't playing any audio and the CD drive wasn't getting any power. I don't know, I had this theory that like the only reason why they let Olaf keep the thing in the first place is because like they disabled it and like you know, just by plugging the yeah. wire into the yeah. wrong hole. Yeah, yeah, so they disabled it and then they're like, all right, here, have this. And that's like, if you look at the yellowing like on the front where the controller ports are and stuff, you can see that like it was plugged, the controller's plugged in for like a while. It's probably just, just sat there on his desk. So nowadays, if you know the right people and get really lucky and show up on the right day, you might be able to end up in a hotel room at a gaming convention playing the Nintendo PlayStation. And the room I was in was full of people who had this crazy reverence for the machine. It was spoken about in hushed terms when it wasn't being tweeted about in all capital screaming. It was a big deal who was going to be let in the room and who wasn't. You weren't supposed to carry drinks around it or cross through the wires going through the middle of the room while people were playing on it even though people did both of those. I had one friend next to me, we were, we were playing the Japanese version of Kirby's Dream Course, and he just said, wow, it's unreal that we get to play with this thing. This, this is where it should be. It shouldn't be sitting on the desk of some collector gathering dust. Another friend of mine was calling it the million dollar console when referring to it getting thrown around this room even though that doesn't really describe the kind of offers Terry and Dan have been getting. I was contacted by a couple TV shows. Uh, Pawn Stars kept bugging me for a while. They wanted me to come on their show. Pawn I pretty stars. much told them to, you know, fuck off. I was like, I'm not going on your show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it would have been nice to tell Rick to shut it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I never liked that show. I never liked those guys, so I kept telling the lady to screw off. And then uh, some other show... Uh, it was called From Rags to Riches. riches. Yeah, they thought we this became lady instantly rich. wanted us to go on the show because they thought we became like instantly rich because of this thing. And that's and why I said that lady. She called me like a half a dozen times. Yeah. I said, I don't know how you think I'm rich just because I own some. I'm freaking broke. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> no, I still work a day job every day. So. Yeah. What are some of uh, the more memorable or, or interesting <laughs> offers you guys have been getting for um, this thing? When we were in Hong Kong, a friend... Our friend Dixon, he's friends with some uh, pretty movie important star. people out yeah. there. It's not a movie star, he's a director. Yeah, well, it was brother. No. Well, <laughs> yeah, it was his brother. No, it was both of them. It was okay. his brother. He doesn't know what he's talking yes, about. Yes, I do. No, I'm not. It's just it was Chinese this, movie this famous director and This famous director and his brother are big collectors, mm -hmm. and they wanted to buy it. Um, both of them. <laughs> one of them has to have the money. Yeah, the one that's the director. That's what I'm saying. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And okay. uh, he offered us $200,000 for it, but American. we told him now. Yeah, 200000 That's before Ben did his magic with it. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like, if anything, it's worth less now because it's not entirely original. And this insane amount of reverence is being bestowed upon a machine that more or less is just a Super Famicom with the region locking disabled and a CD drive attached. In fact, Ben Heck's analysis suggests that the Nintendo PlayStation wouldn't have even had enough horsepower to really be able to compete with the Sega CD and the TurboGrafx-16 at the time in terms of graphical fidelity, and while I was playing this, I was trying to keep all of this in mind and be stoic and neutral about it. But then, on the way back to my own room, I did feel a bit of that tingle, a bit of that reverence. 
Because like the Atari ET landfill and any Polybius arcade cabinets that may exist, this prototype might not actually have a lot of use value, but use value is not what mattered back there. These fans had an insane amount of reverence for the machine based on the story it represents. It was the same kind of speculative, exciting, what-if question that oftentimes makes the hype cycle of unreleased games and consoles more popular than their finished products. So what this prototype is, is a sign that if history had gone even slightly differently back then, we'd be living in a whole different world today. And that's the appeal of it. That's why it's this huge news story, and why they can tour around with it and get at least some big money offers for it. As fans, we have an incredible craving for a good story about the things we love, maybe even more of a craving for the stories than the things themselves, and that's why this prototype is such a fun artifact. It's proof that one of the most tumultuous, decisive, butterfly effect stories of gaming history really happened. 